Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, wow, those lights are bright. You've heard every speaker say that. So, um, uh, I am Vinay Gupta. Uh, I was the launch coordinator for Ethereum in 2015. Uh, and I have a background in cryptography going back into the 1990s, working on both sides of the fence, both kind of civil liberty stuff, but also for uh, both the US and UK militaries, cryptographic applications, research. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is what we've learned from seven years of trying to get physical stuff to behave properly on the blockchain so that you get the thing that you expect, which is you buy an NFT of a house or you buy an NFT of a gold bar, and everything kind of just works after that point. Uh, and the thing that we've learned, and you know, if there's a sort of you know, one second takeaway, it's this. The thing that we've learned is that the real world is really freaking complicated. Um, if you take an industry like the gold industry, the gold industry is arguably six or 8,000 years old, and it turns out that it's six or th 8,000 years old, really smart people trying to figure out how to get maximum economic advantage from their lives in the gold industry. And because that's been going on literally forever, they've gotten really freaking good at it. So the real world is a place of massive layered accumulated complexity. And that massive layered accumulated complexity uh, means that when you come along to try and digitize that, it's a radically different experience from attempting to digitize something like an NFT. Something like an NFT, it's pretty straightforward. The complexity is millimeters deep. You get to the real world, you look at something like a tax code, it's 150,000 pages, and it's been wrangled over for literally two centuries. So the nature of the real world has to be um, considered very differently from working with pure digital objects or even standard financial instruments. So financial instruments, which are the bulk of what people are digitizing these days, when they say RWA, they mean something like a T-bill. The majority of those financial instruments are remarkably well behaved because of vast scale standardization. Every T-bill is like every other T-bill. They're essentially products of industrial mass production. And as in products of industrial mass production, there's a very, very strong similarity between every object and every other object. The legals are very similar. The documents that describe the assets are very similar. The contracts are very similar. The best practices are well understood. The custodial infrastructure is you know, well nailed down. So there's an entire world of things which are extremely standardized. Every share of IBM is like every other share of IBM. Every share of a publicly listed company has some similarities with every other share. But all of those things put together um, you know, still have this massive layered complexity. It's just that there's already an abstraction layer because these things have already been digitized. Um, equity started to be digitized in a big way in the 1980s. So there's been 50 years of building software and building ab abstraction to handle equity and bond and T-bill and all the rest of these kind of assets to give you this sort of standardization layer. But for the assets that have never been digitally traded, all of that work remains to be done. So if you take something like uh, the wine industry, the wine industry is staggeringly decentralized. Right? Every vineyard does its own thing its own way. A lot of them have weird custom and culture, and I say weird, it's weird to me, weird custom and culture going back 150, 200, 300, 500 years. You know, you get to France and you ask them to change the way that they're doing wine, and it's like going to America and asking them to give up guns. It's just core to the identity of that specific vineyard. Well, you know, two weeks before everybody else sells their wine, we sell our wine because we are a little different. We're on the south side of the hill. We mature it a little differently. You know, this thing has been in the family for 400 years. This is how we do things. So th this is the kind of first takeaway, right? The real world is fabulous embedded complexity. When we then get to digitizing things in the real world, different asset classes have different benefits to different people. And if you're not thinking in terms of real world buyers, the appetite of the crypto markets for real world stuff are pretty limited, right? Maybe they want to buy sneakers, maybe they've got a bunch of money and they want to buy a house, maybe they're used to buying you know, expensive things digitally like NFTs, so the idea of buying a house using the same format seems pretty cool, but the actual market size of all of that stuff put together, relatively limited, right? Where the real action is, is finally getting the real world use cases where the buyer and the seller come from outside of the crypto domain and the buyer and the seller do their deal in crypto. 
Right? Now, that could be USDC on one side and real estate on the other. They're still doing dollars for a home. But in that scenario, um, you know, you're not necessarily dealing with dollars that originated from, say, trading. You could be dealing with dollars that originated from somebody's savings or from a mortgage. So when you start getting out into this kind of stuff, everything becomes very driven by customer need, customer requirement. And our broad observation is that four classes of things have four different fundamental drivers. Uh, I'm going to start with the infamous Stradivarius violin. Very high value art objects, generally speaking, look to the blockchain for fractionalization. You have a physical thing, it's extremely expensive, a violin might be five to 14 million dollars. You want to transfer ownership of that violin to everybody that loves that violin, that has heard that violin played, and there might be a thousand or 500 or 800 owners. So it goes from being owned by a European royal family to you know, the aristocracy, and it goes from the aristocracy to the people. So you think of all the people that would go to like, you know, the Metropolitan Opera, and they would like to put 10 grand of violin equity into their 401k plan, and you do enough of that, and the violin winds up owned by the people that listen to it, and this is obviously a great thing, right? This is a form of community ownership of shared assets. So what those folks are looking for from the blockchain is fractionalization and governance. And those are two very, very important kind of core use cases for that community. Um, for real estate, real estate is the world's largest asset class and there is no electronic exchange for real estate. Obviously, you want to digitize real estate because that's the world's largest asset class. You can't trade it electronically. The paperwork hall on real estate transactions is very much like the paperwork hall on stocks and shares in the 1970s. We still do this stuff in a way that's recognizable for decades. Needless to say, the inefficiencies are spectacular. Uh, in America, a real estate transaction until very recently had a 6% fee that was basically a standardized fee from a cartel that ran the real estate business. Right, that was the kind of the brokerages, 6%. There's only recently been a $400 million class action suit to break down that, four uh, that 6 percent barrier and allow price competition. That's the first real opening up of real estate in decades. And I think that's a huge opportunity, by the way, for the blockchain. Um, uh, wine, and by wine, I mean wine paintings, you know, expensive handbags, anything where the expectation is that it will have a single owner. That's about fraud, and it's about provenance. If I can demonstrate for sure that this bottle of wine was bought for $12,000 directly from the vineyard and that it's been in secure storage every si ever since, I can sell it for $12,000 plus some uh, degree of accumulation of value over time. If I have you know, a scrap of paper on the back of an envelope and it's been sitting in my fridge at home for five years, the odds of getting $12,000 for that are basically zero because everybody doubt discounts the offer. Well, you know, maybe you stored it improperly, maybe you drank it and you rebottled it. Yeah, maybe there could be any number of problems there. One time in three, if I buy a bottle of wine under these circumstances, it will be a dud. Okay, I'm going to offer you $8,000. And that kind of massive discounting of secondary sales is one of the reasons that we have a take-make-waste economy. There's an endless stream of stuff that is bought. It's impossible to resell it without losing half the value. People then just throw it in the garage and sit on it. And that illiquidity percolates out through everything. Uh, final thing is gold. Um, the core argument for gold is very, very, very simple. Uh, attaching the word stable to anything with the US dollar associated with it is insane. How did we wind up in a situation where the core thesis of Bitcoin was the US government is incapable of stopping printing money and therefore it's going to destroy itself? How did we wind up with the product of that system being labeled a stable coin? This makes no sense. Hence, Gold is a much better way of backing crypto than dollars. Uh, if you need stable assets, let me recommend gold. And there are specific ways of doing gold. Allocated gold bars numbered as NFTs, much better than gold tokens in general. So I, I want to move on to talk a little bit about definitions of objects. Um, objects are networks. There's a bunch of academic stuff from a guy called Bruno, Bruno Latour and other folks in that field that kind of talk about this. But fundamentally, no high-value object exists outside of a network. Uh, if you take a piece of real estate, 60 people worked on it, the materials came from you know, 400 different places. Uh, you know, the roof tiles are from here and the nails are from there, and if any one of these things has a defect, it can destroy your building very, very quickly. 
oh, the plastic that we used in the roof, that was the wrong grade of plastic. Well, there's water coming in. And, you know, I, I've, I've seen that problem, right? You know, you actually see this stuff every time you touch real estate. Similarly, you take the infamous $35,000 handbag, you know, the ch chain of suppliers could run directly into a, a fake bag, but it could run into a real bag that was manufactured by massively underpaid labor who were being squeezed way, 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 way too hard by the luxury goods manufacturers in a way that's illegal. You could wind up with a problem with, you know, any step of this process, you know, just something can come out and bite you. So when you start actually looking at how these assets are being handled, you have to think of a real world asset project as being a documentation of a complex value network. So you see an NFT for a real world asset. The NFT needs a documentation package that unpacks and unpacks and unpacks and unpacks to give you insight into every single thing that gave that asset value. And this is really the generic benefit of using the blockchain for these kinds of assets is you can have a digital representation of a complex value network and that is not something that you can do in a paper transaction. It's also something that e-commerce is really bad at. Um, does anybody have a hard time buying things on Amazon because you search for something and everything that you seem to find when you search is some knockoff piece of plastic crap that you don't believe will be any good when you purchase it? Amazon 15 years ago didn't have that problem. Their business model has changed. But what it's created is a huge sort of incentive gradient for getting really, really crappy stuff. And it, it's gradually drowned out the ability to just use Amazon as a source of truth for physical materials. You just don't believe what you read on it anymore. If you had more insight into the value network and you could see who the manufacturers were, you could see who the designers were, you could see how the stuff had been handled up until that point, you would have dramatically more confidence that when you bought something, it was actually what it was you thought you were going to get. Um, so documentation standards for these complex value networks are a critical step in how the blockchain generates value. Um, my company, Materium, has a documentation standard that does that called a Materium Asset Passport. It's an excellent starting point for this kind of work. Um, so, next thing I want to talk about is the layered nature of the real world. So, this is the legal stack that allows you to take an NFT attached to a piece of real estate and have a reliable guarantee that you can exchange that NFT for the title deed. And that stack has layers going back to 1958. So, at the very bottom, there is the 58 Convention, UK Arbitration Act. Uh, Two years ago, the UK Jurisdiction Task Force set up a set of rules for digital dispute resolution. We were involved in drafting those rules. That project was led by the most senior judge in the UK for commercial law. So at that point, that's a sort of huge linkage between the 58 Convention and the blockchain. That's a staggeringly important thing that almost nobody really uses other than us. But let me tell you, that thing is a for real you know, power tool. Then you get international arbitration, you get warranties, special purpose vehicles. That machinery is well understood from business in general. You would see that in any substantial commercial real estate deal. Everybody knows how to do that. And then on top of that, you finally get a bit of blockchain specific stuff, which is option agreements, the NFTs, the material asset passport, and all the rest of that stuff. Right? So that stack covers at least four radically different things. An international treaty layer, uh, a set of very innovative judges and senior barristers, um, uh, a set of standard practices from the real estate industry, and then a bunch of blockchain-specific legal machines. So those processes, to get this thing to work, you have to be able to have a single system that's capable of bridging four completely different systems of knowledge and systems of knowing, such that you get an integrated system that gives the user what they expect, which is I buy the NFT, I get the house. To get that kind of one-click behavior, you have to have that one-click stretch all the way back through the implementation stack right to the beginning. Uh, and this is not, you know, should not surprise us too much. Uh, if you think of the OSI stack, this is the kind of standard internet engineering task force thing for talking about how you do this stuff. That model, you know, goes all the way from the physical specification, Ethernet jacks or Wi-Fi radios, right the way up to applications. And the layering of that thing is not that different from the layering of the legal stuff that I discussed. It's just the nature of real-world complexity. Anything that has 
a physical end and a digital end is going to turn out to have these kind of properties. Um, uh, so I touched briefly on the New York Convention. The New York Convention is the most accessible route to get any kind of global jurisdiction for your blockchain transactions. If you want to be able to buy and sell something between basically any two countries on Earth, more or less the only place you could go to get the kind of legal machinery to do that is the New York Convention. Very old, very well understood, everybody uses it. It's, it's just the way that business operates internationally. You're going to have to synchronize your blockchain transactions with that. Um, final slide, space industry really needs DeFi. So one of our uh, real surprises in this process is that the space industry is staggeringly hungry for capital and it wants to sell a bunch of really strange things like a future reservation of a time slot to have a tugboat that hasn't been built yet come and attach itself to a satellite which hasn't been launched yet to pull the thing up into a higher orbit. Because they're deploying capital 5, 10, 15, 20 years ahead, because a mission can have multiple years of kind of work before it's actually launched, legal agreements between companies for services for systems that haven't actually been launched yet are beginning to become a thing. And at that point, you think, what would it take to have a marketplace for imaginary rights on space assets that haven't been launched yet? Why that's, you know, how can you get that done? Well, the answer is some kind of commodities market based on the blockchain looks ideal to the space industry partners we have for doing this kind of stuff because it allows for the creation of arbitrarily complex objects with a lot of documentation packages, including assets which are defined by software. So you take a chunk of code which describes the orbital mechanics of some kind of thing, you can just put that directly into a blockchain transaction. Um, and I think that that is going to be a real sleeper. But you know, don't be surprised if in a few years you hear people talking about space fine, it becomes a serious thing. Uh, I think that gives us a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah. Great, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, if there are no questions, let me fill in 30 more, minutes, 30 more seconds on space. Yeah, okay. Because the space thing is amazing. So, what people want from space is the ability to deploy staggeringly complex technical systems that provide services to the Earth. So if you think of Starlink as an example of this, at home I use Starlink because I live in rural England and the internet is horrible. Best available internet comes from space. Similarly, um, you know, things like satellites, GPS, uh, geospatial imagery, all the rest of these kind of systems, all of that stuff is about providing services to the ground from space. If you want to finance space projects which are going to provide services to the ground, those are relatively straightforward commercial transactions. The problem is it's almost impossible to get people to invest in the space industry because there's such a fear of the complexity from traditional tr finance people, it's very hard to get money into these projects. So the prospect here is that if you could get the right set of financial instruments designed and then basically sold out into crypto, DeFi type stuff, what that provides is a kind of mass enthusiastic heavy lift capacity. If you say, right, you know, we got four NASA scientists and we are going to produce a satellite and it's going to produce the following kind of information about, let's say, the way that climate change is affecting agriculture and it's going to help farmers, you know, adapt their crops to the environment that we're in. If you get that kind of capacity, it's quite hard to get private equity to fund that. But if you had really good documentation on something like that and excellent proofs that it was going to happen in the right kind of team, the idea that you could finance that on crypto essentially by ICOing entirely possible. What do you ICO? The future service tokens. This will be one token. It will give you 15 minutes on the satellite at the time of your choosing. There's going to be a market for this stuff. There's going to be auction pricing. And so basically you pre-sell the services of the satellites before they're launched. And if you pre-sell enough of those services, you launch. You never launch, all the money is returned to the people that put the stuff already in. It's basically the kind of utility token stuff that people were talking about doing in 2018, but applied to an industry that has actual utility. Um, and it's surprising how credible that looks to people in the space industry, including for things like scientific research instruments like telescopes, pre-selling telescope time, you know, you're going to do a PhD, you've got a grant, you want this much telescope time, that satellite is going up in a year, you need to buy the time in 18 months. That sort of stuff actually makes sense inside the context of the space industry. 
So I think we might discover that there's some actually very heavy use cases in that domain in a year or two, although by far the cash cow is going to be real estate because real estate is $3 trillion of transactions a year done on technologies that don't really work, uh, also don't neglect container shipping. UK government estimates a $280 billion a year of savings from container shipping. Uh, so there is a lot of close to market stuff as well, but you know there is also uh, a really surprising amount of interest from space. Uh, I guess that's it, thank you very much.